Hello and welcome to the 103rd episode of Growing Up Geek, the weekly podcast for geek entertainment and nostalgia. My name is Brad. I'm joined by my brother Rob. Whew. Merry Christmas. Give me a Red Bull. Give you a Red Bull for Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody, uh, or your respective holiday of choice. We are back from our little break. We're actually recording this on break. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fortunately for us, it's the the break between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. Not everybody gets it. I but. hope that everybody played a lot of games, used a lot of technology, watched a lot of movies in the interim uh, while we were off last week. But hey, hey, how was your Christmas? My Christmas was good because I got to see you. I was there. Yeah. You shouldn't ask me that question. I was there. <laughs> it's for the listener. Oh, well, my Christmas was great. I got to see my brother and my other brother and my sister. Yeah, we saw lots of family, and you and like 40 family members went to the IMAX wow. and saw Avatar in like a mass family Avatar experience. Yeah, our cousin Nate uh, accrued some tickets on Fandango the night mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. and just got them for everybody. So he actually bought all like 40 tickets ahead of time? I think so. Dang. And I mean, people paid him back. Yeah. Um. I didn't pay him back, but he said that I could owe him. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that when you get into a dangerous Oski situation. Wait, well, I was looking for like an ATM or something. I don't typically right. carry much cash on me, but the right. nearest one was like at a restaurant two blocks away. So yeah, he's like, don't worry about it. So you got to see Avatar. We're going to bring our Avatar thoughts. We actually both saw it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was on the fence about it, but actually mom and dad uh, went ahead and offered to go see it with me. And uh, it's funny because it's a 3D movie and mom gets vertigo and dad has a lazy eye <laughs> and can't see 3D, really. So It's the worst movie. I know. Yeah. It's and like, let's go see the worst movie ever for you. Um, and some of dad's brothers have lazy eye too, and they were, they were seeing it as well. Yeah. So there's an interesting perspective there <laughs> from the person who can't see 3D. Well, maybe we'll bring that perspective. Maybe we can be the crucial lazy eye podcast Yeah. <laughs> for those people out there who can't see it. And we can do a, a colorblind puzzle fighter minute mm-hmm. or something occasionally. Yeah. Well, more. In, did you know that colorblindness uh, can also affect your ability to see 3D if the glasses are yeah. two different colors, which... Uh, when we got the the glasses to see the movie, Matt was looking at it, and in like when the screen was white, like he was right. looking at it beforehand, he could tell like they were slightly different colors. One was like a mm-hmm. green, the other was like a purple. Oh, okay. And he wasn't sure. He's like, "Crap! If this is you know color based, he's color blind, and it right. might affect his ability to see." It. Alas, it did not. Yeah, well, good. you didn't have red and blue glasses, did you? No, not red and blue. Okay, yeah. Like, but they're just like those polarized ones. Under normal lighting conditions, they look just like the same, but if you hold them up to a white screen, you'll see that they're they're mm-hmm. different, slightly different colors. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Cool. Anyway, so that's that. Yeah. Um moving from that, I, I kind of had a great <laughs> science fiction movie week because I got to finally see District Nine. Uh, which came out on Blu-ray and uh, DVD. And, uh, I have not seen this, nor have I gotten a Blu-ray yet, so jealous yeah. on both counts. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um, you know, for a movie that was super cheap, you know, made on a low budget, uh, people probably know this is the guy that was all set up to do the Halo movie, Neil Blom- Blomkamp. 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 And he <laughs> uh, didn't have a lot of money, but he pulled out a really fantastic-looking science fiction movie like especially on blu-ray this is a really like reference quality disc and you know after the movie was over like we had a friend over and amber and i were talking and she was like didn't they use a suit for the aliens half the time and we really couldn't tell and i think that's always the you know definition of good effects yeah is we really couldn't tell i mean the, the aliens in this movie are so convincing um so special effects wise great i also really enjoyed the uniqueness of this movie it's Definitely something I haven't seen before. A bit sort of like a alien take on like the Holocaust. It's sort of like you know a, a racism story. Yeah. Mixed in with a little bit of like a half life. That your your hero is a really nerdy guy named Vickis, spelled with a W, <laughs> um, who is a unique guy. I actually had a friend say, oh he's he's like Borat or something, but I didn't find that at all. He has sort of like an English sort of accent, um, being that they're like in Johannesburg. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he was a, he was a sort of unlikely hero, and he you know gets his courage up eventually, and it's it's just really a unique story that I think any sci-fi fan needs to see, 
And, um, you know, leading from that into Avatar, it was really a cool week for me because here's a super cheap movie with admittedly great looking visuals. And then here's like the world's most expensive movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought both of those films very unique in their premise. And, uh, you know, so that was really cool for me. But uh, the only downside I have to say about it is that it is pretty gross as a film. And I don't think a lot of people talked that up in their review that it has a lot of gore. I've heard um, that though. Yeah, yeah, things blow up in in uh, District 9 and even just at the beginning I was like, "Come on," because there's like people peeing and then when that's done somebody pukes and then when <laughs> that's done there's some Jeff Goldblum fly type stuff that goes on and mm-hmm. so there's a grisliness there, but um if you can get over that, some of that kind of graphic grossness. Uh, <laughs> man up, all right? Just man up and love the movie. <laughs> get your strong stomach. Yeah. And no, you know, once that once the sort of I mean they're showing off the dirtiness of these slums and these places and, and you know, they help you to get buy into that. Once it gets rolling, I actually found the gore factor to be like almost deserved based on the elements of the movie. Um Sure. But yeah, District Nine is I I'm definitely gonna say in the running for a top of the year because that was just a really quality film. Sweet. Sweet. How about yourself, sir? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things I discovered over break, uh, I opened jailbroke, I don't know what the word is, my phone. I don't think they say jailbroke, but just... Right. Well, because uh, it's not. Like, with with iPhone, it is, right. because Apple doesn't want you messing with it. Palm, like, the sweetest thing about this is they're like, oh, yeah, to unlock your phone, simply enter the Konami code. <laughs> right, yeah, you show me, and you actually type it out. Like you, you type it out. You don't yeah. push an up. You type up. Yeah, U P U P D O W N. Like you just right. type the whole thing out. B A start at the end, and then this icon pops up that says unlock developer mode. Right, and it's sweet. And then you hit that, and now, um, if you have the right software means, mm-hmm. you can go to. Uh, I went to precentral dot net. Right. Downloaded their software to hook the the thing to my computer via USB and get that running. Right. And from there, you're able to install a piece of software on the Pre itself called Preware. Sure. <laughs> which then, now, you're opened up to the world. It's it's like a third-party app store, mm-hmm. but also that has tweaks for the thing, and just everything is, is, is accessible through this little piece of software. Which So if anybody owns a Palm Pre... Like yeah. I highly recommend this, and I was even I, I was using it, and uh, <laughs> our cousins I think they sure. all have palm prees because their dad got it for them. Oh wow! And they were all gathering around like, oh, could you unlock mine? Unlock mine! <laughs> like, yeah, because they saw what I was doing. Because like I get like the software keyboard that everybody wants. Yeah, you know, and, and it I comes get... without the guilt of jailbreaking because <laughs> Apple frowns on that. Right, and like this, I'm not even concerned if there's an update release for the palm pre because it's like. There might be a compatibility issue, but it's not going to, like, brick my phone. Right, sure. You're not going to be like, well, we've discovered that you've been doing this. Like, no, I can I can freely right. turn my, you know, camera on here into a camcorder camera. Right. And, and you're saying that, yeah, go ahead. And that's my decision. Right. They probably and- choose to not do that by default because it'll drain the battery like anything, but Yeah, but you can I'm do it if you want. It. Yeah. Yeah. And you can make apps. You were saying that there's also some sort of developer software oh, that's yeah. very easy to use that Palm's trying to really push because they need apps. Yeah, the Ares uh, app development. Mm-hmm. It's an in browser app creator. You go to like right. Ares.palm.com and you sign up for this thing and then you go right on there and like in the middle of the screen is a is a fake virtual Palm Pre, or you can make it a Palm right. Pixie if you'd like. You can change which way it's oriented. And then you can, like, drag and drop menu items. And, and then, like, once you get something looking good, then you can, like, flip it around to go go to the back end, see the code, alter mm-hmm. it, flip it back. And I've seen, like, you know, people are, are doing a lot with this. Even amateurs, they're like, yeah, uh, I think on Gizmodo, the guy was like, I wonder if it works. And then a few seconds later, hey, it works. Like, he made, like, a button where, <laughs> like, you push a push one of the buttons and like a cat meows so you guys all have palm prees and i think that's cool although matt's is like horribly broken in such a way where right. the screen is splintered he can see everything but the only the left side responds to touching and i was like well, what do you do he's like well i just touch only what's on the left side i guess right 
Well, he's going to take it to Sprint now to get that replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, he he has the security warranty thing on that, so it should only be like a fifty or a hundred dollar deductible, right? Uh, to get that fixed, if even he might be able to smooth talk him into just replacing it. But yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, so, ultimately, I'll- like I think it's a good showing on on Palm's behalf because they are faltering. People aren't as excited about them in the news, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're going down without a fight. That this Aries thing is beyond anything Apple or Android are offering. It's it's yeah. Look, it's gonna make it easy to make apps, and hopefully one day this app store goes out of beta. <laughs> it, and that's so crazy because Palm used to be the the leader. Palm was the thing, you know. Everybody had a Palm Pilot, right? The early PDA days when it, when when it wasn't a phone, it was just your PDA or whatever, right? And uh, you know now that they're faltering behind a little bit. But what is the app that you most desire? Like when you look at the other stores, you know, what's the thing that you would love somebody to write first? You know, maybe someone will be listening oh, that's savvy. Well, I'm excited about anything that's kind of the reality enhancing yeah. stuff that's recently come out. <laughs> right. Uh, you were showing me, you know, the star map um, where you right. can point it in any direction. Yeah. You know, you can see like tweet locations and. Yeah, and I was using Layar. Layar is this one where you actually overlay a layer over reality, and it sort of turns you into the Terminator, where you see right what you're looking for, and it's like here is pizza nearby you and it literally shows a pizza floating in midair right which my friend jason responded so now you're just gonna have a guy following holding this up in front of him following (laughs) a pizza while cars like fly by narrowly (laughs) you know very close to him exactly um but yeah all that stuff is very cool yeah i'm that especially and then on top of that you know certain triple a kind of titles you know i would like to see defense grid on there oh yeah yeah well we have uh robo defense which is like a tower defense game yeah i never understood the beauty of tower defense until after playing this and amber actually got really good at it and got into it um it's like one of the few tower defense on android but it's just it's command and conquer but it strips it down to just here they come like it takes it to the battle level where it's like you're not building You're just, here comes the enemy, and you only have turrets. Yeah, it's like playing as the Protoss in in StarCraft without having to concern yourself about anything else. Yeah, and I like that simplicity, because it's like you can really focus on this one element and have a lot of strategy in just the turrets, you Mm -hmm. know, and where to place them. Yeah, similarly, I I got Plants vs. Zombies. um, It's half price right now. Mm Mm-hmm. So I, I playing that and really enjoying that. Whereas the turrets are now plants in your lawn, and you know you have right. zombies creeping towards them, and you have to plant the plants yeah. to defend <laughs> your your house from these zombies, which is a really clever idea. And, That's great, uh, and it's one of those games that issues hopefully the end of zombie-based games so that we can finally bring in Viking-based games in 2010. Yes, that that's my that's my wish. My Christmas wish is that we can stop pirates. <laughs> and zombies and move to vikings i i hope so too and maybe blizzard will bring back the lost vikings oh wouldn't that be cool and uh they because they said they haven't given up on consoles necessarily yeah and their last console game was the lost vikings for the super nintendo right exactly so but so your palm is uh unlocked it's unlocked it's worlds more fun than it was i've tweaked it to be the way I've wanted it to be. That is very cool and definitely an, ad- an advantage. Um, so let's move on to Avatar. Yes. Uh, the movie that with the, the, the craziest, longest history, especially for geeks because, you know, and, and for us, and we've mentioned this countless times on the show, but, you know, this movie's been in development for like 10 years from James Cameron, a guy that, in my opinion, has never made a bad movie. And then there was this massive, like, great geek reaction at Comic-Con to the 3D footage Tons of websites updated with, you know, great reviews. Oh, man, it's the greatest CG I've ever seen, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Cut to a month later when we all get our hands on the trailer and we all vomit in unison into a bucket, you know, because it just looks like Delgo. I mean, it looked like a CG, crappy, animated movie. And something about it wasn't translating. That, That was sort of the hint that I was getting. And uh, I was like, you know what? I barely want to see it, but we got to see it just to know. And then you obviously saw it in IMAX. Did James Cameron make a bad movie? (laughs) Or what? (laughs) Did he make a bad movie or what? Like, how were you going into this after all of the ups and downs? You know, low expectations? 
Oh, I was going in with, actually, I would say raised expectations because as much as I wanted to avoid the press, um, it started to right. creep in. You know, people started talking about this right. movie and buzzing about it, and I was, right. was seeing tweets about it and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, that being said, here's my little tweet about this movie. Sure. I liked it. I think James Cameron has delivered a great movie here. And despite some weird things that you could be like, well, you know, it, it, I don't think it lived up to this, that, or the other thing, mm-hmm. but man, does it deliver just a great movie experience. And I think I kind of come back to, like, people's reactions to Uncharted 2, right? for example, because it's easy for the outsider to kind of scoff at it like, you know, without experiencing it, just being like, right. huh, well, I'm seeing very little innovation here. I'm This is very clearly just borrowing from this and borrowing from that. Right. I mean, Avatar wears its inspirations on its sleeve. It is <laughs> yeah. not at all a science fiction movie of the caliber of like 2001 maybe right exactly not that kind of real sci-fi this is like well you know if you go visit an alien they're not going to be essentially native americans you know this is space pocahontas in many ways (laughs) it is there's a whole cowboy and indian vibe yeah and uh you know i will say also like you said james cameron is sort of pulling from his past movies here you've got marines Mm -hmm. you've got sigourney weaver Mm -hmm. you've got a guy in a mech suit Mm -hmm. or many mech suits Mm -hmm. um the corporate guy who is evil you know uh, you know brings memories of paul reiser um you know all that stuff so and he wrote this and I don't know, I, you know, I have to look and see, you know, if he wrote everything in the past as well. But and I think there was definitely some echoes of some of that. Yeah, there definitely is. But James Cameron stuck to what he knew and mm-hmm. in the end executed it all near flawlessly. Like I have trouble mm-hmm. thinking of something that I would have changed about this movie. Right. So let me rewind back here and say the it's it's clear to me that his goal was to take you to an alien world right? and to do so in the best possible way he could. And that is yeah. using this IMAX technology, using advanced 3D technology, and using a story that, you know, maybe is not the most original thing, but I think that people, it, it's established enough so that people can relate to it they won't be thrown off guard by like kind of the the weirdness of it all. No, you yeah, I, I was gonna say I think the story actually serves the technology very well because we have a guy who is going to go through this new vision into this foreign place, yeah, and, and sort of look through new eyes. And you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I felt like really it was the perfect thing to do to show off a new technology or some you know amazing 3D kind of visuals is to say you know we've never been here. We're going to go there now, and then when you're in, you're like, I am kind of experiencing something different. Yeah. And and you used the word experience before, and I really think that's what I would sum it up as for me too. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really good, and I think it's best as an experience. Like, it's a ride. It's Disneyland. I don't think this is going to work so well on DVD. I think that was part of the problem with all these trailers was that we're looking on these little 2D screens, and we're not mm-hmm. getting the full you know sense of it. But in 3D, in a nice big theater, it was an experience, you know, and one that I hadn't had before. Absolutely. And uh, I guess we can say, you know, concerning the 3D, um, this is good 3D technology, mm-hmm. but there's a there's an inflection of question in, in my voice because I think what makes it good is that it's not popping out at you. Oh, right, right. Like, <laughs> the, tr- the trailers before... Yes. Were for Alice in Wonderland and for Piranha. this NASA thing. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're all using, you know, cheap 3D tricks, you know? <laughs> like I did are- jump in my seat when that piranha shot out because I was yeah. like, oh! Right. Things are just flying at you and blah. And then mm-hmm. Avatar starts up. And firstly, like, everything just seems a little bit further back, a little bit less 3D, you know? It's all mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, it's it's there. It it has texture. It has dimension to it. I think somebody put it this way. Is the movie was directed without 3D in, in mind. mind. Sort know? of, yeah. Well, I'm sure it was well with 3D in mind. But, but yeah, you don't. it doesn't wear that on its sleeve. What I like about it is that you... 
Yeah, you, you look down a hallway and you see the depth or you there's a flower in front of you and you would like to focus on that and kind of just observe it and you kind of feel like you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you almost feel like you're sort of in the space and you can kind of just kind of soak it in. Now, you know, I, when I say that, a lot of people are going to picture, holy crap, it's like virtual reality. It's still a little bit blurry, at least in my, and I also wear glasses under my glasses, but yeah. They're converging two images together. Mm-hmm. You still see a little bit of the blur. But for the most part, I was able to forget that a lot of the time and just kind of experience the depth. Yeah, it, it's not mind-blowing. You know, it still relies on um, very, you know, established technologies, very affordable technologies. You know, it's like yeah, you could yeah. have everybody sit down in a room and strap on 3D goggles and that's it, you know, like they're or, or yeah. like strap on virtual reality helmets, and they all just watch the movie on their own screens, you mm-hmm. know. But that's not possible. Um, Talk about your IMAX experience a little bit, because yeah. you said you were like shoved all the way into the front row. I didn't see this in IMAX, and I actually was wondering if they were going to be. Now, I will say it was a rectangular screen at at Lowe's when I saw it, just in 3D. Mm-hmm. What was it like in IMAX? That's like a large square screen, isn't it? Yeah, I I joked to Matt is like this kind of looks like it's going back to three by four aspect ratio, right? Um, <laughs> but it's huge, you know. Sure. It, it it really where we sat, it filled the field of vision. Um, <laughs> yes, and you said you could see the pixels. Right. Well, we were sitting the second row from the screen, and if you're sitting in the first row, you can basically just walk up and punch the screen if you wanted to. Sure. Yeah. Like, it is so freaking close, and it's, it was clear to me that where we saw it, the IMAX um, was not built for that theater, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, at, at King of Prussia, the IMAX that I regularly go to, the seats are, like, elevated above the screen, so it's kind of like this balcony that, like, goes out, yeah. and the screen kind of dips down beneath that rail. Right. Um, so you got like this full thing. At at this place, like it was literally like they just crammed it into this room, you know, that a <laughs> yeah. regular screen would normally be in. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh yeah, we were so close we could see the pixels. It was it's probably the one drawback of a digital camera is that you can see the pixels and, and the effect is more or less like watching something through a screen door sure because you can see like if you were to focus on it you could see the uh the lines and stuff but uh right the in-betweens you know mom actually enjoyed it she only got vertigo a few times (laughs) (laughs) and dad uh, not seeing 3d apparently didn't bother him but mom liked it the best i think of all three of us Mm -hmm. and she said you know she pointed out especially because the main character is crippled which by the way the best visual effect of the movie in my opinion is his crippled legs oh which are completely like withered and I don't know how they did that. <laughs> um, and you know, I know, I know that there's computers now, but the, the shots of it really look like real legs. Yeah. Um, that he's just kind of they're they're emaciated. Anyway, um, mom loved how you know he was able to finally in in the avatar you know mode stand up and run, and how excited he got by that. And I, I actually think yeah, that was really mm-hmm. that's really cool. And and being able to <laughs> you know kind of live the the two lives. It, it reminds me of that. I told you about that dream I had where I was suddenly in virtual reality and I knew that I was, but it was so realistic and I felt the sand and all that stuff. Yeah. He's sort of doing that in this movie. He's sort of like looking at his hands through new eyes and kind of, you know, touching things he's never experienced. Yeah, he takes and, a big bite of fruit, like whenever he yeah. first gets into the body. Like, and the facial animation when he does that. And, and I will say, these CG effects are not like. Let me contrast this real quick with District 9. Um, that's a very stark, photorealistic looking movie. Mm-hmm. This is not. This is uh, a painting. Yeah. This is artwork. This is an artistic CG thing. However, with one exception, which is the facial animation is so good in this movie. I think this is the, the next best thing I've seen to Gollum. Mm. Is, uh, the girl character, the girl Navi, is so good yeah. in the face. I can't think of a single complaint I would have with that animation. It was as a as a person would look. Yeah, it was in its Weta workshops, which kind of mm-hmm. ties that all together. Like they did Gollum, and now they're doing this. Um, oh, d- is it Weta? Because I th- I saw ILM at the end. I think they all are like chipping in with this thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> James Cameron's like, I got a bazillion dollars. Who wants it? Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, you do forget that you're watching anything that was rendered rendered in 3D. Like I think a, a few, it's a two and a half hour long movie. So right. at least like an hour in, 
your mm -hmm. your senses are just worn to the point where you're no longer like, well, I think I can tell that that's 3D, or I think you don't care anymore. You're just like, this is sweet. Um, right. It's the the world is so amazing and alien that you have nothing to really compare it to. So why bother? You know, it it all looks though like you could touch it you know yeah they're very careful about mixing humans and the cg i noticed that Th most of the time yeah i thought that was a very <laughs> good move of him <laughs> that was admirable and, yeah like he yeah he's not like george lucas who would force all these things together in a scene and be like well we're gonna figure out how to uh fix that and maybe we'll open up some new avenues of filmmaking is james Cameron okay. was like no we're gonna avoid as many <laughs> yeah possible Problems areas where actors. people will see the strings as possible <laughs> yeah and and so yeah you mostly have real footage with the actors and then you have the sort of cg version and it moves between the two kind of a good move in doing that because there's a definite split where they enter the pandora and it's like okay why well, I, I expect this to look different yeah you know, and by the way, going back to District Nine once again, both of these movies shame George Lucas, <laughs> especially in the eyes. I think there's a lot to do with eyes yeah. that they missed out with Jar Jar with his oh, f scary, freaky reptilian eyes. Yeah, they're, the uh, the Navi are, I think, intentionally so humanoid because right. a, there's a lot of small facial ticks in in color cues and dilations and things like that that we recognize even subconsciously as meaning certain things that right. had James Cameron made these any other kind of alien, we might have, you know, been confused by what's going on or somebody might have had to have stated it blatantly like, well, yeah. the color of her skin hath changed color, so <laughs> she <laughs> is ready for a mate. It's like, no, yeah. you don't need that. You go off of what human beings do like my fa one of my yeah. favorite things like I, I think i let out you know a, a little laugh at it but mm -hmm. when the navi girl is is sort of told by her mother to teach this guy right you see her just go ah, like freak yeah. out and like oh what you know like the Completely way a, realistic a teenage girl does when her mom's like you're doing this and there's nothing yeah. you can do about it like no, I'm. I swear, every shot of her face is yeah. perfect. Like when she's ah, she does that stuff a lot, and right. when she talks to him and says, you know, this is sad, this is not happy, and all that stuff, it's so mm -hmm. dang perfect to what a person would do. It really sh felt like they just recorded the actress and then just sort of mimicked exactly what she did with the CG. Um, I'm going to take back something I said before okay. in, a, in, a, in a tweet, which is um, I tweeted that you know, couldn't they just do this with blue makeup? Like honestly, like the the reaction I had to their weird CG bodies, I'm mm -hmm. like, can't they just do something more realistic? Having seen it, <laughs> right. The reason that they can't do it in blue makeup is because they're freaking huge. The Navi yep. are giants, and uh, seeing the scale of that mixed with everything else, um, mm -hmm. and you know, as I say that, you know, I, there's probably a way you could have got away with it, like Gandalf style with force perspective, but. Yeah, having them be so big and interact with their world like that, I really did think it, it made sense. Yeah, I think in the end what James Cameron set out to do, which was to put you in this alien world, he, he mm -hmm. really found the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. He found a plot device that allowed you to enter the eyes of a native right. to the world, but still not know anything about it. You know, that's his thing. He, yeah. And so, so you still are learning about how this world functions. Yeah. He also found a, um, a. I thought it was neat where they placed this, which is years down the road from initial contact, so that there's no p point where they're trying to learn each other's language or anything like that. Like they mm -hmm. get past that. Yeah. Sure. Um. The 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 natives the the Navi are already aware of this whole Avatar project. Right. So there's no, you know, like situation where it's it's this, you know, well, you lied to me about who you are and I, I don't understand. Like, yeah. that's out in the open already. All of this stuff is out in the open right. so that we can just sit back and learn about this world, how they interact with creatures, how they interact with plants, yeah. how how their their society is structured and and in, just enjoy it. And I think it, it by by putting it in this kind of uh you know, like I said, space Pocahontas, but sure, also maybe yeah. a better thing is is Dune, right. as far as like the, where this narrative is borrowed from. Mm -hmm. By doing that sort of um, conservation film, right, 
where normally it would be about appreciating the the earth and what that was. Yeah. It's a great way to have us appreciate Pandora. Yeah, it's interesting that he's always had the Marines as the good guys. Yeah. And here's the first time where James Cameron puts all that Marine and military technology in but makes mm-hmm. them the villain. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and we are on the side of the organic blue, you know, people, something that he hasn't typically mm-hmm. he had us fighting aliens. And yeah, winning, and I almost wonder if he he thought, you know what, I'm going to flip that this time. The aliens will be the heroes. Well, I don't know if as much for that point. If it wasn't like I said, it, to to appreciate the world that he took us to, mm-hmm. this is like out point. of all the out of all of Robert McKee's options for yeah. a storyline. <laughs> sure, the one which is a film about you know learning to appreciate the earth you know yeah, yeah exactly. is the best thing to learn to appreciate an alien world yeah um at two hours and 30 minutes it is a bit long i will say if you're going to go to the theater and there's no other way to, yeah. to do it i mean i like i said i just don't think dvd is going to do this justice i i don't even think the film is going to date well i think this is you know the cg will probably get pretty cheesy over time this mm-hmm. is the time to see it um mm-hmm. and it's and, and like i say I, I would go to the theater um but at two and a half hours make sure you bring a butt cushion or something. I, I, you know, it was it, toward the very end. I'm like, I'm enjoying this, but it is long. You know, I forced myself to pee before the movie. I <laughs> wow, knew how long it's gonna be? I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's the review. I, I, I don't think I agree with you that it that it's not gonna age well. I think this is gonna be a good movie for a while. I think mm-hmm. that people are gonna look back at this as mm-hmm. this movie pulled off 3D and made it work in a very accessible way. I don't know that it's going to win any Oscars or anything, but I do think I do also agree that now sure. is the best time to see this movie, especially if you have an IMAX. I would say go see it. I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. it again in IMAX just so I can sit a little further back. Uh, 3D tends to pop out a little better whenever you're further away from the screen. Yeah, and it has that weird effect where it is three dimensional, but there are edges. Yeah, you know what I mean. At least if you see it in a, a standard you know, theater. And so you have things coming towards you and they're almost about to jump out and then you see them cut off. Right. Which is like a, such a weird, you know, yeah, thing. I typically didn't get that too much. Cause I, I was sitting in the MST <laughs> aisles as I, put. you were inside the film. Yeah, exactly. Like everybody just saw my silhouette just pointing. I'm like, yeah. Hey, <laughs> I'm picking his nose. <laughs> exactly. Well, cool. So that's avatar. Oh, Hey, one more thing. Sorry. Just, yeah. I thought James Cameron did well. Okay. And that's subtitles in 3D. Oh, <laughs> yeah. This is usually something that is so awkward, but I just realized it like as I was watching it, somebody would be speaking and the subtitle would appear in 3D yeah. but kind of near them and near their plane of 3D. Then somebody yeah. else would talk and maybe that would appear closer to them. I was like that's brilliant. That's a great yep. idea. I don't feel at all like alien like weirded out by the sudden pop up of text. Yeah. So yes, and I am looking forward to Battle Angel if that ever comes out. Right on. I don't even know what that means, but on that note, that's that's his next. Oh wow. That's the project he started before this one. Yeah. And then bumped over <laughs> to do Avatar, right. and then he'll bring back. And I, it's it's based on an anime. Okay, a female heroine, I assume, or like a female hero. <laughs> No, I think it refers to flying mechs in outer space. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, So that is Avatar. Uh, And before we close our show, we always like to get a little nostalgic and uh, reminisce about growing up geek. This week, going to bust something out of the technology graveyard once again. Way before (laughs) there was an iPhone. (laughs) That's right. The bones. (laughs) Yeah, you can smell the bones. Uh, way before mm-hmm. there was an iPhone, there was an iPack, the Compaq iPack. Yes, indeed, and I had one. You, a PDA that you had. And I want to talk about that, but also about how you and I, and we were talking about this over the holiday break, you and I have always pretended to have what doesn't exist yet. Yes. So the iPack was not an iPhone, but we wanted it to be. <laughs> we did. I, I immediately was like, this thing needs a phone. <laughs> yeah. The iPack was this touchscreen, Windows-based, which was a mistake, <laughs> admittedly. It was by um, HP. And it was cool. It was a PDA. It did its stuff. But, man, in the end of the, at the end of the day, it was terrible. Hmm. Like, there was no keyboard for it, so I had to have, like, this keyboard that I would open up and would, like, fold in four places. So it would, like, fold out, and then yeah. I'd put it in there, and I'd type and in the at the end of the day, I was like, man, why don't I just have a laptop? Yeah, it was such a 
yeah, and that's exactly the thing that I went through with the sidekick was, oh, man, it was like a portable computer, heck yeah. Well, you know, a portable in-my-pocket computer is what I pictured. Right. And then when it, actually using it, it was like, this pales compared to my laptop. Really And does. I think we just wanted the Pre and the iPhone and the Droid, and they just didn't exist yet. So we took the – it was almost like, you know, I say, it was almost like we're from the future, and we're just like, uh, what can I use today that's the closest thing possible? Well, I'll grab mm-hmm. this iPack, you know. Yeah, I mean, Matt got the uh, the one of the earliest MP3 players way before the the iPod came out. Right. Because we wanted that e- even though it cost way more and you know, it wasn't really as portable and it had AA batteries that died every second and it could only hold like 15 <laughs> songs. Yeah, it's I like, think it was like 12 songs. Yeah, it, it was like, nah, but man, look, I'm putting MP3s onto a portable device. Exactly. And that's going to be awesome whenever this is better. <laughs> you when know? this is better, it will be awesome. Exactly. I had Sorry, I'm like thinking I had the Freestyle Pro. But yeah, that was pre-Wiimote, right? I mean, that was like motion control. Pre-Wiimote, pre-anything yeah. that like that. Yeah and, yeah, and I think the most embarrassing of all of our, you know, we want this now, but it doesn't exist, so mm-hmm. here's the hack, was Rock Band. Because you and I, <laughs> for a long time, <laughs> when you would come home for summer break, you would always bring your guitar... And yep. you would play real guitar while I, on the keyboard, would pretend to play the drums. We had this, <laughs> you know, like giant Casio keyboard or whatever it was. Right. With like the, you know. Perfect. On the keys. And I would break the keys from hitting them so hard. And so then I would have to move down a little bit. You'd have to find the other key that had the yeah. same thing. <laughs> I'd have to find the other key because it was like a 40 or 90 key. However many keys are yeah. on a keyboard. You probably know. Like 104. Um, all right, so and I would break the one and move down to the other, but I would do the keyboard drums while you jammed on the guitar, and that was like our version of Rock Band because like, we just wanted to play like covers. I think know? that's more your version of Rock Band. I think me playing real guitar is other <laughs> yeah. people is what people play Rock Band to emulate. No doubt. Yeah, I, I wanted to play drums, but I didn't know how. Flash forward to you actually playing drums with Rock Band, mm-hmm. and you're like holding the sticks in such a way to use your fingers. Yes. Because that's how you keep beat, typically. I do. I actually yeah. mess my fingers up a lot during Rock yeah. Band because I, I, I pinch them like chopsticks oh. a little bit. Right. Where my fingers, my, my index fingers are pointing out, and they just keep I, getting banged I, <laughs> against the yeah, stick. Yeah, see, I need to teach you how to hold drumsticks properly. And I've seen you know people say, here's how you hold them, and you just you know kind of like a, you know, a light, and I, I can see how it's better. And yeah, I try that, but then I end up going back to the old... Right. Well, especially with drumming being such a violent uh, <laughs> thing, Violence. people can wear themselves down quick by drumming. You know, they're yeah. they're always the first band member to strip because they're just like... Yeah. Oh, like. <laughs> exactly. But uh, basically, you want to keep your hands straight forward and then just put the stick in there. So, mm-hmm. like, you're not turning your wrist in any way. But, uh, yeah, I, I feel sad yeah. for you. You know? <laughs> and I feel sad for myself sometimes, and especially whenever that was our my version of Rock Band and your version of the iPhone and the Sidekick and yeah, all this ghetto stuff. And and it continues yep. to happen because I really think that things like Instant Stream and things like Rhapsody are just the precursor to the service that we really want, which is the all-encompassing music slash video, you know, slash mm-hmm. movie service that gives us all of it. Here's you know? a good question. Like, why isn't Zune doing video on demand? Right. Like, well, and the technology on the 360 is so good. Right. The new update is so good. They need to just do that as a streaming service. Well, they have Zune Pass already for the music, you know? So right, here's, they do. here's a service that has video and has music and has games and portable devices to support it. And, and like, all right, so you have your $14.99 a month Zune Pass for right. music. Why not say, and for $20 a month, you can have, you know, Zune Pass Pro, which has every freaking thing. I bet it's going to happen, you know, because they are positioning that icon right next to the Netflix icon. Gosh, though, Netflix catalog continues to grow. So. Oh, yeah. But anyway, that is uh, the future today. I'm going to yeah. just submit my little thing here, which is that I do believe that the Wii is the future today. Okay. That uh, it's not quite where it want, people want it to be. That's obvious right. because of things like Wii Motion Plus and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Natal is going to do it. Maybe the Sony thing. 
Yeah. But I think in the end, it'll be a combination of Sony and Natal. And something that records your voice or something like that. Yeah, just all forms of input are covered. Yeah. They made a very crucial point at the Sony thing, which was the guy picked up a gun and shot it. Yeah. And he said, there's certain things that you need a trigger for. True. And I was like, oh, man, Natal's not going to have any guns. <laughs> right. And and it doesn't recognize fingers. They recently pointed out, you know, your hands yeah. are just sort of blobs to Natal. There isn't like the <sighs> sort of fine definition. <laughs> that That should be question number one anytime somebody's designing a new controller. Does it support guns? Good point. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think that's going anywhere <laughs> in terms of gaming. Yeah, people love guns and... Yeah, and they, they will make new forms of gaming when these are the main control inputs, but uh, I don't think you're going to see the end of guns. Yeah, not anytime soon. So that is our uh, show this week. Thank you for listening. If you want to follow Rob or I throughout the week on Twitter, you may do so at twitter.com slash gugbrad and gugrob. Uh, you can also send us an email if you have a question and you'd like us to read it on the show. Uh, that is mail at growing-up-geek.com. Uh, Once again, my name is Brad. I see you. And we'll see you next week.